Last week, we started a message series called Making a Difference, and we looked at a prayer that Jesus prayed 2,000 years ago. In John 17, Jesus prayed, Just as you sent me into the world, I am sending them into the world. So God sent Jesus into this world on a mission. He came to seek and save the lost. He completed that mission, and now he's sending us on a mission to our world. Last week, you were encouraged to have the courage to pray a simple three-word prayer that said, God, use me. And if you have the courage to pray that prayer, then fasten your seatbelt because God will use you to make a difference in our world. It might be right here in our own community. It could be across the ocean to needy people in Africa. So today's message is called See a Need, Meet a Need, and we're going to look at the story of the Good Samaritan. That's a powerful story that calls us to meet the needs of those who are hurting. But before we get to that story, let me tell you about this study that was done about the Good Samaritan. This is a modern-day study that was done at Princeton University. The point of the study was to see how we would respond if we were put in situations like the person in the Good Samaritan story, to see if we would be Good Samaritans or not. They went to Princeton Theological Seminary, So the study was conducted on people who were preparing to be pastors. So remember that. They selected a group of pastors and put them in a room and said, okay, we want you to prepare a talk on the Good Samaritan. Then one by one, we're going to call you and send you across the campus to the chapel where you're going to deliver your talk on the Good Samaritan. But here's what they did with the study. For a third of these future pastors, when they were called to go deliver their talk at the chapel, they were told, you know, you have plenty of time to get across campus to deliver your talk. And to a different third of the pastors, they were told they had just enough time to get across campus to the chapel to deliver their talk. They don't have to rush, but they do have to stay on schedule. And then to the last group of future pastors, when they were called to give their message, they were told, you're late. You better run across campus and get there as fast as you can because they're already waiting for you. So now, on their way across campus, each one of these future pastors encountered someone who was obviously in need. Right in the middle of their path was a person who was slumped over, who was coughing. They were out of breath. They were in desperate need of help. So here are the results of the study. 63% of those who were early, they stopped to care for the person. That's not too bad. Remember, they were told they had plenty of time, 63% stopped to help the person. But before we think that's pretty good, let's remember 37% of those people who had plenty of time still ignored the person in need. But the second group that was told they had just enough time to get across campus, 45% of that group stopped to help the person in need. So that means over half of them chose not to stop and help. And what do you think happened with the third group when they were told they were already late so they had to run across campus? Only 10% of that group stopped to help the person in need. So that study discovered that when we become really focused on our own needs, that we either don't notice the needs of other people, Or perhaps we see the needs of others, but we don't take the time to stop and help because we think our needs are more important than their needs. And you know, it's easy to be hard on people in that study, but what about you and me? Let's say that you're already going to be 10 minutes late to work and you have this major project waiting for you at your workplace, but then you run across a person in need. Do you stop to help that person in need? Or do you just keep going because your day is already so busy? As we read the story of the Good Samaritan, I think it's good to stop and ask ourselves, what would we do? What would you do? What would I do? So the background of this story is that Jesus had just delivered the teaching that you should love your neighbor as yourself. After he gave this teaching, someone asked him, well, who is my neighbor? So then in Luke 10, it says, Jesus replied with a story. A Jewish man was traveling from Jerusalem down to Jericho, and he was attacked by bandits. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him up, and left him half dead beside the road. By chance, a priest came along, but when he saw the man lying there, he crossed to the other side of the road and passed him by. A temple assistant walked over and looked at him lying there, but he also passed by on the other side. 
Then a despised Samaritan came along, and when he saw the man, he felt compassion for him. Going over to him, the Samaritan soothed his wounds with olive oil and wine and bandaged him. Then he put the man on his own donkey and took him to an inn where he took care of him. The next day he handed the innkeeper two silver coins, telling him, Take care of this man. If his bill bill runs higher than this, I'll pay you the next time I'm here. Now which of these three would you say was a neighbor to the man who was attacked by the bandits, Jesus asked. The man replied, The one who showed him mercy. Then Jesus said, yes, now go and do the same. So this trip from Jerusalem to Jericho was an 18-mile trip, but it was a 4,000-foot descent down a very rough, rocky part of the road. So what would happen is that these bandits would hide out in these caves near the path, and then they would attack some of the travelers to steal from them. So this Jewish man was traveling this road, the bandits attack him, beat him up, leave him half dead beside the road. The priest walks by on the road, ignores the man. The temple assistant comes along. He also ignores the man. But then in verse 33, this despised Samaritan comes along. And you need to remember how much Jews and Samaritans hated each other. Many people listening to this story would say, you know, I'd rather sit there on the side of the road and die from my injuries than receive help from a rotten Samaritan. So this despised Samaritan comes along and what happens? The story says he felt compassion for the injured man, and he did all of these different things to help him. In verse 36, Jesus asks the question, Now which of these three would you say is a neighbor to the man who was attacked? The man says, The one who showed mercy. Jesus said, Yes, now go and do the same. You know, sometimes when Jesus would finish telling a parable, his followers would be confused and wouldn't really understand the parable. We don't have that problem here. The meaning is very clear. Jesus wants us to show mercy to people. He says, go and do the same. So what exactly is mercy? If we're supposed to show it, what is it? One person said, mercy is love in action. It's not just enough for us to say that we love someone. Jesus wants us to put our love in action. And Jesus wants us to open our hearts to people who are in need. So how do you recognize it when people are in need? Sometimes it's obvious Like when you see the injured man in the story that Jesus told. And sometimes in our world, it's pretty obvious when people are in need. But there are many times in life when a person might be in need, but their need is more hidden. And that's when you need to be patient and dig a little deeper to discover what their needs are. So this morning, I want us to try to answer the question, how can we help those who are in need? There's no shortage of people who are in need. So how can we help people who are in need? First, we can encourage when someone is hurting. The word encourage means to give courage or speak courage into someone's life. And there are many different ways that you can encourage another person. If you think of professional baseball teams or pro football teams, how do the players encourage each other? If you watch the games on TV, you see them running around slapping each other on the butt. It makes you wonder how that ever became a form of encouragement. Yeah, I would advise you not to try this in your workplace. You'd probably get slapped with a harassment charge. But some of you might remember an NFL star named Chad Johnson. He was also known as Ocho Cinco. Back in 2013, Johnson was in a Florida courtroom, and he had accepted a plea deal with no jail time for violating his probation agreement. But after Judge Kathleen McHugh told Johnson he should thank his attorney for doing a great job for him, Johnson swatted his attorney on the butt. The people inside the courtroom erupted in laughter, but the judge was not amused. She changed her mind and sentenced him to 30 days in jail. 30 days in jail for a butt slap. So the Bible tells us that we should encourage people who are weary, but maybe not with a butt slap. Isaiah 35 says, With this news, strengthen those who have tired hands and encourage those who have weak knees. Say to those with fearful hearts, Be strong and do not fear, for your God is coming to destroy your enemies. He is coming to save you. So I think we all have some times in life when we're tired and it feels like we have weak knees. That's when it's helpful to have somebody come along and offer some encouragement. And as you go through life, you're going to encounter people who are tired or they're sick, or they can't find a job, they're going through a difficult time, 
you can be that person who comes along to offer encouragement. And I think it's helpful if we think of some specific ways to offer encouragement. Think about encouraging people with your words. Can we agree that words are very powerful? A word rightly spoken at just the right time can go a long way in bringing healing and encouragement to another person's life. So as you go through the week, you're probably going to hear a lot of words from people that can just suck the life right out of you. But that's why there's such a need to hear some encouraging words from people. A second way you can encourage people is with your prayers. Every one of us should have a good friend who's just a phone call away where we can call that person and say, can you be praying for me? I'm really struggling with something today. I need some extra prayer. So let me ask, when's the last time you made a phone call asking for prayer? And if you haven't made a phone call like that lately, then what's stopping you from making a call like that? Is it pride? Do you think you can handle any problem that comes at you in life so you'd never need to reach out to people for prayer? I feel sorry for anybody who has that attitude. We're broken people. We need each other. We need prayer support from our Christian friends. Make sure that you encourage people with your prayers and make sure you ask for prayer when you need it. A third way to encourage people is with your presence. Sometimes the best thing you can do to offer encouragement is just to be physically present, to offer your support. Maybe you can't really fix the problem, but you can offer support. You can support someone as they seek treatment for an addiction. You can support somebody on their journey through grief. One person said, as you go through life, there are really just two kinds of people. There are those who encourage people, and there are those who discourage people. They take the courage from you and pull you down. So God wants us to be encouragers. Hebrews 13, encourage one another daily as long as it's called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. So on an average day, are you more of a discourager or more of an encourager? Make sure that God's using you to encourage people. Here's the second way we can help people in need. We can guide them when someone needs wisdom. There's times when people need encouragement and sometimes people need wisdom. And we need to be wise about when we choose to offer guidance. Wisdom is a proper word spoken at the right time. Wisdom needs to be del delivered with tact. You can offer wisdom to your children. You can offer it to your friends. You can offer it to your coworkers as your parents age. You may need to offer wisdom to your aging parents. People need wisdom. But if you aren't a wise person, then they won't listen to you. The principle is this. Before you can speak wisdom into another person's life, you first need to study and gain wisdom in your own life. And the Bible has a whole book that's devoted to wise saying. It's, it's called the book of Proverbs. Proverbs 4, getting wisdom is the wisest thing you can do, and whatever else you do, develop good judgment. So that's something to pursue in your life. Pursue wisdom. Proverbs 3, happy is a man who finds wisdom and who acquires understanding. The flip side of that verse is miserable is the person who doesn't find wisdom. Last week, if you were willing to pray the prayer, God, use me, then one of the ways God will use you is he's going to use you to guide other people. Think about the people in your life for a minute right now. We all have some people in our lives who have taken a wrong turn, and now they are not following God's best plan for their lives. What if God wants to use you to speak to them? Think about that. Luke 17, be alert. If you see your friend going wrong, correct him. So be alert. There's people around you. Who can you help? You can't help every person, but there are some people God wants you to help. The Bible says we should always be ready to help people. If we really love our friends and our coworkers and our families as much as we do ourselves, then we need to be willing to tell them about the most important thing in our life, which is our relationship with Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 3, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. So that says there's a right way to do it, there's a wrong way to do it. Do it with gentleness and respect. And then finally, the third way we can help those in need is this. We can give when someone else is in, when someone needs help. 
So in this parable that we looked at today, Jesus says that a priest and a temple assistant both ignore the person in need. And personally, I would expect the priest and the temple assistant to be the ones who would stop and help, wouldn't you? It just makes you mad. If they're supposed to be serving the Lord, why don't they stop and help? So I find myself getting frustrated with them. They chose to ignore a person in need, and they just kept going on with their day. They obviously thought whatever was on their agenda was far more important than helping somebody in need. But then what happens if we stop and ask the question, what would I do? When I have a really busy day planned, am I willing to change my plans so I can go help a person in need? What about you? Maybe you have a list of things that's a mile long for when you leave church today. And the last thing you want to do is change your plans so you can help somebody in need. We go back to the book of Proverbs again. Proverbs 14, it's criminal to ignore a neighbor in need. But compassion for the poor, what a blessing. Proverbs 11, the one who blesses others is abundantly blessed. Those who help others are helped. So there is a blessing that comes from God when we choose to help another person. You know what I think the real problem is when it comes to helping people in need? They usually need help when it's very inconvenient. Think about our story. It was inconvenient for that good Samaritan to stop and help. It would have been far more convenient for him to just keep going. It was inconvenient for that Samaritan to take that person, put him on his own donkey, take him to an inn, leave the money, and say, if there's any more cost, I'll pay you when I get back. So I think the big question for all of us is this. Are you willing to be inconvenienced in order to be used by God? That's a big question. Are you willing to be inconvenienced in order to be used by God? I think it really becomes a hard issue. If your heart's right with God, then your heart will also be open to people who are in need. You're going to see people through the eyes of Jesus, and you're going to want to help people. In 1 John 3, it says, Dear children, let's not merely say that we love each other. Let us show the truth by our actions. So as we apply today's message, I want us to remember what Jesus said at the end of this parable. He said, go and do the same, meaning go and show mercy to people who are in need. So when I think back to that Princeton study where the different groups of future pastors prepared a message on the Good Samaritan, but then they ignored a person in need on their way to deliver their message on the Good Samaritan, when I think of that study, I just want to ask, how can that happen? The teaching of Jesus about the Good Samaritan was fresh in their memory. And yet, they ignored a person in need. So it occurred to me that if these ministry students were given a written quiz about the Good Samaritan story that they'd been studying, I'm guessing many of them would have done very well on a written quiz. They probably would have explained a few Greek words and done a nice job on their quiz. They could have, all, they all, they could have had all sorts of head knowledge about the Good Samaritan, and yet they failed to stop and put their love in action when they saw a person in need. So I think you could say they had head knowledge, but they didn't have heart change. And I think that's a danger for all of us who follow Jesus. Don't ever settle for head knowledge when God is looking for heart change. I think it's a danger for our churches today. It's easy to go from Bible study to Bible study, getting a lot of head knowledge, but Jesus is always looking for heart change. He's looking for transformation so as we leave church today, it's easy for us to leave here with some head knowledge about the Good Samaritan story. But the real test for all of us is this. Will we allow ourselves to be inconvenienced, and will we put our love in action when we see a person in need? God's church is at its best when it's helping people in need. It's a beautiful thing when God's people put love in action. So I wanted to end today by just celebrating something that happened here at Discovery. I got permission from Jim Biosta to share this story. 
you might remember when we announced that Sherry was going to be in hospice care that I just said, you know, our church loves the Beosted family and we want to support them any way we can. And I mentioned that's a week when there were storms forecast and there could be snow and we'll do whatever we can to help and maybe somebody would need to shovel a driveway. Well, Jim tells me that there was one night during that week of hospice care where he, you know, they were long, difficult days at hospice, but he had somebody lined up who was going to shovel out his driveway because we got hit with a storm. But when that guy showed up to shovel his driveway, it had already been done. So that's a little odd. And as I think of, wow, you know, somebody from the church did the driveway? And I'm, so who would that be? My first thought is that's ah, probably some of our teenagers from the youth group. You know, we've got some good kids in the youth group, and they're famous for doing stuff like that. But it wasn't our kids from the youth group. So then I'm going, ah, who would that be? And then I found out later, it was Gary Zenner. Gary Zenner 73 years old. And Gary went over there and shoveled out that driveway so he could be helpful to the Beosted family. And I guess uh, Jim talked to Gary later, and Gary said, you've got a big driveway. <laughs> But, you know, I just thought that tied in so well with this whole see a need, meet a need. You know, it's like Gary says, there's a need. What can I do? I can go shovel that driveway. So Gary let God use him. He saw a need. He met a need. And really, I think that's the invitation that's here for every single one of us today. God is eager to use each one of us. See a need, meet a need, and make sure God gets the glory. That's when the church is at its best. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you for the way that you work through your people. It's so great when I just see love in action, the way that people serve each other and help people in need. It's a beautiful thing. And, of course, the ultimate model is Jesus, what he did for us. So I just pray that that will inspire each one of us. Open our eyes so that we don't walk by somebody in need. If we're having a busy day, help us to slow down so that we can see a person in need, take time to do whatever is helpful. Just use us, Lord, for your glory, and we just want you to receive the glory, because it's a beautiful thing when your church is, is living the way you want us to. We get, ask you to give us the strength now and the wisdom to be faithful servants. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.